Well, good morning, Christchurch Midrand, and a warm welcome to another one of our services. Online is great to join you uh, this morning. Uh, as we start off, I'm just going to read for us a passage in Scripture uh, that speaks about who God is and what He has come to do in our lives. So listen to these words uh, from 1, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has made His light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus. Uh, And what Paul is saying to the Christians then um, is that uh, through Jesus we get to know the glory, the best of who God is. Uh, And this morning, later on, we will hear uh, about this Jesus. And as we listen to the music, we're going to uh, sing music that sings about and speaks about this Jesus. So why don't you join me as I lead us in a time of prayer as we focus our attention on this God as he's displayed in the face of Jesus. So please bow your heads wherever you are uh, as I lead us in a time of prayer. Father, thank you for yet another opportunity uh, to live, uh, to Um, glorify you with our lives. Um, And so as we hear about Jesus, I pray that you uh, would glorify yourself or would show us um, your glory. You show us the very best of who you are. Uh, As we uh, think about this year, I pray that you would help us to cling to Jesus uh, and to hold on to him. So please be with us this morning uh, and please focus our attention on Jesus. Uh, We pray this in your name, in his name. Amen.
from my knees I lift a prayer to you, my Savior. For my life and for the world, you're the answer, Jesus. Greetings, family. Please join me as we do the prayer of confession together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. We have followed our own ways and our own desires, and we have neglected and broken your holy laws. Have mercy on us, Lord. Restore those who repent and confess their sins according to your promises declared in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that hereafter we may live a righteous and obedient life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please join me as we do the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, he died and was buried. He descended into the place of the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Christ's holy universal church, the fellowship of Christians, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please bow with me as I continue to pray for us. Lord, this morning we acknowledge you as our King, our Creator, and our Father in heaven. You are holy, you are righteous, and you are gracious and merciful. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. You are to be feared above all gods. You are sovereign and we worship your holy name. Thank you for your great love which you have shown us on the cross through the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We didn't deserve it, O oh Lord, but it is only by your grace alone that we are saved today. Please help us to live our life to the glory of your name. Thank you for all that you provided for us as your church in the past year. We are grateful for all your blessings to us, Lord. Please help us not to take this for granted. And Lord, we continue to commit 2021 to your hands. Your word exhorts us to commit our work to you and our plans will be established. Help us, Lord, to always remember that you are in control over everything and that you know what is best for us, your church. Lord, we remember those who have lost their loved ones through COVID and other illnesses. Please comfort them and draw them closer to you. We also remember those who are sick and lonely. Please surround them with your love. And we pray that they may find comfort in knowing that you are with them always. For you said in your word, you will never leave us nor forsake us. O oh Lord, we pray that you grant wisdom to our president and the government as they lead the country through pandemic. And we continue to pray for our economy in South Africa and those who are suffering from the state of our economy. Please provide for them, Lord. We pray for our church and, and the growth of your kingdom, even in these challenging times. Lord, we pray for the health workers all over the world. Please protect them as they look after those who are sick in hospitals, especially during this period of pandemic. Thank you for the work they do and all the sacrifice they go through to help your people. Now we pray for your servant Martin as he will be teaching us your word this morning. Please help him by the power of your Holy Spirit to teach it faithfully and with clarity. Help us to be receptive to your word and seek to be more like your son Jesus Christ. We pray for those who don't know you, Lord, to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and be saved through the preaching of your word today. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning as we start the new year, I want to focus on our Explore Training Program 
and uh, our next course is starting this coming Sunday, the 17th of January. Now, let me explain Explore. We've been using Explore. Here's the first uh, module. It's called Explore the Bible. There are eight modules, and it is written by our Bible College, George Whitfield College, and uh, it helps you to understand the Bible better. So your textbook, apart from this handbook, is actually the Bible. The way to grow as a Christian, you can't just say, I want to grow. No, they are means of growth. So we grow through God's Spirit, we go th grow through God's people, and we go grow through God's Word. And so Explore is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And uh, hundreds of our people here at Christchurch Midrand have gone through Explore. And we would like to encourage you and invite you to join the first module. If you haven't done Explore, why don't you trial run the first module? It runs for 10 weeks, and we run it from 5 till half past 6 on a Sunday afternoon. And you can do a trial run. You don't have to do all eight modules. You can just do the first one. But the first one is a critical module. It's called Explore the Bible. And it gives you an overview of the whole Bible. And it shows you how the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, is one story. And it shows you how it all fits together. So it's one of those critical, critical uh, modules that gives you this wonderful bird's eye view of the whole Bible. So if you've struggled with how the Old Testament fits together and how the Old Testament fits together with the New Testament and what does the Old Testament have to do with Jesus, you need to do explore the Bible because you will find that suddenly the whole Bible opens up to you as you understand this one story. So the other classes which have been running for the last two years will continue. I will be taking over Panganai's module, um, but there'll be the new module, a new class starting this coming Sunday. And all you need you to go do is go onto, the, go onto our website, go online, and you can register uh, to do module one of Explore, Explore the Bible. Don't miss it. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining our service this morning. Uh, and I do hope that you'll be, you've been blessed and that you will be blessed by the message later on. I just uh, have a few family news items to bring to your attention uh, to let you know about what's happening in the life of Christ Church Midrand. Um, so just if you have kids, uh, please uh, note that the Kids at Home videos will be uploaded onto our website. So go onto our website. Uh, and find those uh, videos and we do hope that children will enjoy learning about Jesus uh, from this video so please go on to our website uh, and uh, help them uh, find their way um, to those videos uh, the other announcement family news item is regarding our, our in-person meeting uh, so obviously we're navigating um, times where we are unsure what um, what's going to happen uh, so depending on what the president announces uh, we will, if he allows us to meet next week, we will have an in-person meeting. So depending on his announcement, uh, but we will still be live streaming our services next Sunday. So there will be a live stream service. If the president allows us to meet, we will meet physically uh, in person because we love um, uh, that family aspect where we get to meet one another. And we'll put up uh, more information this coming week so please be on the lookout for our newsletter as we uh, give you more information about what's happening regarding our uh, in-person meetings but uh, once again there will be a live stream services so please remember that um, and then lastly uh, we are at Christchurch Midland committed to making disciples who make disciples that is our mission uh, and that is our plan and as you give financially to the work at Christchurch Midland. That's the vision you're giving to. Uh, so can I encourage you, can I remind you uh, to, uh, to give to the work at Christchurch Midland? You can do so uh, via our EFT. Uh, that is the best way for you to do your normal giving um, or through Snapscan and the details will be uh, on, on this video. So please uh, give generously to the work here at Christchurch Midland. Blessings.
Good morning, church family. I hope you're all doing well this morning. My name is Michelle Mari, and I'm going to be doing the Bible reading for us today. I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. This is the word of God. Good morning and welcome once again, and a very happy new year to you all at the start of January. My name is Martin, I'm the rector of Christchurch Midrand, and if this is your first time with us, a very, very warm welcome. It's a great joy and pleasure to have you with us this morning online. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1, verse 1 to 13. You may want to turn to the passage, the passage that Michelle read to us. Uh, we're going to work our way through uh, the passage this morning, so it'll be a great help to me if you can turn to that passage. Um, just to say the sermon is going to be a little bit longer this morning because uh, you need a proper introduction to Mark's gospel. So do just take note of that. And then just to mention that straight after uh, the talk, the sermon, we will be having the Lord's table. So you may want to fetch at some point uh, some water or grape juice or bread or a biscuit. And we'll be having the Lord's table straight after uh, the sermon. As you all know, I'm, I'm retiring as rector at the end of March uh, this year. Uh, Royden will become uh, the rector of Christchurch Midrand on the 1st of April. I'm not leaving Christchurch Midrand. I will remain on full-time staff, but my role will no longer be as rector, but as leadership mentor. 
the church council recommended that uh, Royden take a sabbatical before he takes over as rector, so he'll be away until the end of March. And then they've also recommended that I take a sabbatical from the 1st of April uh, so that I can get out of Royden's hair. Um, so these last three months as rector, I'll be preaching every Sunday, sorry for you, and uh, we're going to spend most of our time uh, looking through Mark's gospel. I th thought it was most appropriate for these three months for us to be focusing on, on Jesus, who he is and why he came and how we respond to him. So we'll probably only get through the first three, four chapters, but uh, we'll spend most of our time in Mark's gospel. Before I pray, let me just quickly show you a map of Israel so that you get your bearings as we start working through Mark's gospel. As you know, uh, Jesus lived and died in Palestine, present-day Israel. Let me show you the map. So the map should go onto the screen. Let me quickly run through that just to give you your bearings. On the left-hand side, you have the Mediterranean Sea. And then you have the provinces or regions uh, of the area. So at the bottom is Judea. And you'll notice just above Judea is Bethlehem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is obviously where Jesus died. And then you see the region called Perea. Uh, that's really the wilderness area. And when Jesus was tempted, that's where he probably uh, went into that region. And uh, just to the left of the P there of Perea is the Jordan River, which is probably where John baptized Jesus. Then just up north, you have the regions of Galilee, Samaria. Just above Samaria, you'll notice uh, Nazareth, where Jesus spent his, uh, his childhood years. And uh, in Mark's gospel, the first nine chapters, he spends almost exclusively up in the north, up in Galilee. And then from chapter 10 to the end of the book, he spends in the south in Judea and Jerusalem. So that's just to give you your bearings. You may want to Google a map so that uh, as we work through Mark's gospel, you know where we are in terms of the geography. Well, let's now pray as we come to God's word. Father, we thank you that as we come into this new year, that it is not a new year for you because you are God. You know the beginning from the end. You are the Alpha and Omega. And we thank you, Lord, that time and history and space are all in your hands. And so, Lord, we come to you, the great God of all the universe, that you may draw near to us, that you may encourage us, that you may speak to us, but above all, Lord, that you may draw us closer to yourself, the source of life and the source of truth. So speak to us through your word, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. A good question to ask as we start in Mark's gospel is, who is Jesus? So I googled the word Jesus, came up with over 700 million results. Here are some of the opinions about Jesus, and I'm not going to read them all. Jesus is real in the sense that he exists for those who want him to exist. Jesus was every man. His name could as well have been Jones. Too bad he was in a male form this time round. Better luck next time. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe I am the Son of God. He suffered from what contemporary psychologists now know to be delusions of grandeur, bipolar disorder, and probably acute schizophrenia. There have also been countless so-called portraits of Jesus. Jesus the Marxist, Jesus the freedom fighter, uh, Dan Brown's Jesus, uh, Jesus of the Gnostic Gospels, which were written two, three hundred years after the birth of Christ and are totally different from the eyewitness records that we have here in the Gospels. And then, of course, you have the common view that Jesus is merely one amongst many. So for many people who believe in the supernatural, uh, there's a whole pantheon of gods, of idols, of gurus, of masters, and Jesus is just one of them. Now, I don't need to tell you that that's where our world is, that's where our culture is, that's where many of our friends are, our family are, perhaps, perhaps for you listening here this morning. And what our world finds increasingly scandalous is that Mark presents Jesus um, as absolutely unique, the one and only, the Son of God, the King, the Messiah, the, the, 
the only one through whom you may know God. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine the person of Jesus over the next eight, nine weeks. We're going to work through Mark's gospel, and we'll find out who is the real Jesus. And we'll be finding that out from, from the earliest source documents of Jesus. These are eyewitness records of people who were there. And we'll probably, in the next eight weeks, we'll probably only get through the first three or four chapters. This morning, then, chapter 1, verse 1 to 13, it's somewhat introductory, and uh, I'm going to unpack it under four headings, his identity, his roots, his family, and his enemy. So those are the four principles that will help us to understand this passage. But before we do that, two side roads. Side road number one, who was Mark? Now, Mark never identifies himself as the author of this gospel. But the earliest and most important source came from a man called Papias, who was the bishop of Hierapolis, and he was writing between 90 and 100 AD. Mark is also called John Mark. You meet him in the book of Acts. And he was a disciple of the apostle Peter. In fact, he was Peter's scribe. He was Peter's translator. This is what Papias wrote about Mark, the, uh, the scribe, the translator, for the Apostle Peter, I quote, he, that's Mark, wrote accurately all that Peter remembered. For to one thing he gave attention, to leave out nothing of what he had heard and to make no false statements. In fact, if you go through the Gospel of Mark, you'll notice that almost nothing happens in which Peter is not present. So what we have here is actually Mark's uh, transcribing the eyewitness testimony of the, of, of the Apostle Peter. And no one knew Peter, uh, no one knew Jesus better than Peter. So in Mark's gospel, we see, we hear, we almost touch Jesus through one of his dearest disciples. You really can't get closer than that. In a sense, what you have here in Mark's gospel is uh, Peter's memoirs. No date is given as to when it was written. Historians estimate that it was between the great fire in Rome in 64 AD and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So probably it was around 65 AD, which means it was about 30, 35 years after the life and death of Jesus, which means that there were probably still many, many eyewitnesses alive. So it's almost as if Mark is saying, go and check it out. Side road number two is why should we read Mark? Now, I want to encourage you this week. Uh, I know it's a busy week, but I want to encourage you this week to read through the whole of Mark's gospel, chapters 1 to 16. In fact, it will only take you one to two hours. Perhaps you've never read through the gospel in one sitting. Why not do that this week? Read through these 16 chapters, and what you'll notice is it's not dry history. It's full of action. It's more the doing of Jesus than the teaching of Jesus. The narrative has this, has this breathless speed, this, this abruptness about it. The word immediately, in some translations, uh, translations it says at once, but the word immediately comes up nine times here in chapter one. I only noticed that this week as I was working on this passage. Notice verse 10. Uh, Jesus comes, uh, he comes out of the water and immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. Verse 12, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Verse 18, there's Simon, uh, the, Simon Peter, that's the apostle Peter and his brother Andrew. And we read verse 18, Jesus calls them and immediately they left their nets. Verse 20, same thing, there's James and John. And immediately he called them. And it's all in the present tense. So Mark is, Mark is telling us that this is not just a historical figure. No, he's alive, he's living. He's speaking to us today. Chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The first words of the gospel tell us that God has broken into history. The status quo is no more. It's a crisis. Anything can happen now. 
So Mark not only wants us to see that Jesus is a man of action, but that the living present tense Jesus calls us to take action, decisive action, uh, which we'll get to next week, God willing, in verse 15, repent and believe in the gospel. It's a new year, but it's not a normal new year, is it? Uh, the last uh, Time magazine in December had on its cover 2020 with a red cross uh, going through the words 2020 and written underneath were the words, the worst year ever. So we're all struggling. We're all struggling to make sense of the world. We're struggling to make sense of our lives, of the future. Some of us are, are, are struggling to prevent a sense of despair, of panic, uh, dread, um, flowing over the brim. Perhaps that's where you are this morning. What to do? Well, drugs and drink will only make it worse. A kind of a false optimism that it's all going to be okay, well, it's probably a lie. Well, what do we do? Don't look inside. Don't look in front. Don't look behind you. No, look up. Look at the Jesus through the lens of the Apostle Peter, through the writing of John Mark, and you will discover that the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ is the central event of the cosmos. It's the central event of human history, the central organizing principle of your life. Put another way, the whole story of the world and how we fit into it is most clearly understood when we look clearly at Jesus. You see, it's only his life that can make sense of ours. That's why the answer to our angst is not to look inside of you. No, it's to look at Jesus. And that's why we need to read John Mark's gospel. All right, let's get into our four principles. Principle number one, his identity. And we find that in verse one. So let me read that again. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now remember in the original document, which was written in Greek, written by John Mark, there was no overall title like we have here, the gospel according to Mark. There was no paragraph headings like we have here, John the Baptist prepares the way. There were no chapters or verse headings, as it were. Those were added in later to assist us and to help us. So verse 1 was actually the title of the book. And in the title, John Mark states right up front the purpose of the book, the punchline. So it's not like a detective novel where you have to uh, search for some hidden clues. No, Mark is quite up front in his title, verse 1. The word gospel was the Greek word evangelion. It was, not a, it was not a book. It was not a religious word. In actual fact, it was a secular word. It meant good news. Or more strictly, the announcement of good news. And it was normally used in Roman times for the public announcement of a, of a victory in battle or of a royal birth or of a royal wedding. So you'd have an, an official of the Roman Empire going to towns and villages, making this announcement that a great, uh, that a great battle had been won. Um, in 1868, two stones with writing on them were found in a place called Prien, West Turkey. It became known as the Prien calendar inscription. And it uses the Greek word evangelion or gospel in reference to the birth date of Emperor Augustus Caesar. The stones are dated 9 BC. It speaks of the birth date of Augustus Caesar as the beginning of the gospel, beginning of the good news, announcing his kingdom. Let me quote from part of it. Since providence which has ordered all things gave us Augustus, sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. The birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the gospel, Evangelion, for the world. He surpasses all previous benefactors, end of quote. John Mark is writing, 
Round about 65 AD, when the Romans were killing, persecuting Christians, knowing the history, knowing the meaning of the word evangelion, he makes this extraordinary claim in chapter 1, verse 1. The real good news, says John Mark, is that the gospel is not about Caesar Augustus. No, the real good news is that the gospel is about Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. And he didn't come from Rome. No, verse 9, he came from, from Nazareth in Galilee. Again, verse 1, the term Son of God, it was used in the Old Testament, a key word, phrase, but it was also used as a title of honor for Roman emperors. The word, the term Jesus was quite a well-known uh, name. It was a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Joshua, which means God is salvation. And then the third title here, which is part of the identity of Jesus, is the word Christ. Christ's not a name. It's not a surname. You're not going to find it under C in the Galilee telephone book. No, it's a title. It's a job description. It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So Messiah and Christ are the same words. Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. And it means the anointed king, the reigning king, the ruling king. So when John Mark makes verse 1 the title of his book, 65 AD, it is highly provocative. It's almost treasonable. What he's saying is the true and rightful ruler of the empire is not Augustus, it's Jesus Christ. He's the real king. He's the true king. He's the cosmic king. He's the only son of God. Mark chapter 1 has echoes of Genesis 1. It's extraordinary. And the first and the most obvious echo is here in verse 1. So remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God. Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus. So in Genesis, God is the author of creation. In Mark, Jesus is the author of the new creation. The second beginning is no less momentous than the first. And that's Mark's point. Just... Just one last comment. Francis Schaeffer, in his brilliant book, He Is There and He Is Not Silent, I've just reread it over this Christmas period, and it is quite brilliant. He argues that there are only three possible answers to the question, what was there at the beginning? How did it all start? What is the source of existence? And Schaeffer argues, I think quite correctly, that there are only three possible explanations. Number one, nothing what Schaefer calls nothing, nothing. Not nothing plus energy, nothing plus motion, nothing plus matter. No, nothing, nothing. Now, folks, you all know that I'm not a scientific guy, but it really is quite illogical and unreasonable to have all that we see and are from nothing, nothing. Second option is an impersonal beginning. Now the, uh, the impersonal beginning, Schaefer says, may be mass, it may be energy, may be motion, but it is impersonal. And of course it doesn't answer the question, it can't answer the question, why are we personal? Why do we love? Why do we hate? Why do we long? Why do we have a conscience? Surely we're more than just impersonal plus chance plus time. It's most unlikely. Third option that Schaefer gives us, which is the most reasonable one, is that there's a personal beginning, which is precisely what Genesis 1 and Mark 1 are telling us. Genesis, in the beginning, God, a personal, infinite God. Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, a personal, infinite God. So the key to the universe the key to history, the key to your place, to your future, to 2021, is not some philosophy, it's not some moral code, it's not something found inside of yourself, it's not Biden and Harris, it's not a reinvented ANC, it's not Pfizer or some or other pharmaceutical company. No, it's a person. But the center of the universe is not a mathematical formula, it's a person. 
The infinite person of God, the infinite person of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, he is the key to the universe. And if you haven't submitted to him, perhaps today is a good day. Principle number one, his identity. Secondly, his roots. And we're going to have a look at verse 2 and 3. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah prophesied in 700 BC and Malachi prophesied in 400 BC that before the Messiah arrives, there will be a messenger, an Elijah-type messenger who would precede the king, preparing the way. Verse 2, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now that's precisely what we see in the ministry of John the Baptist, verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And you'll notice verse 6, he's dressed in the very latest Elijah outfit. Now John was clothed with, clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. I think uh, locusts and wild honey was, was the original vegan friendly. In a, in a COVID world where change is the only constant, isn't it comforting uh, to know that the rector of Christchurch Midrand still tells corny jokes and no one laughs at his jokes. Something hasn't changed. Now we, now we, now we all understand what it means to prepare the way for someone who is important because that's what John the Baptist is doing. So before the president makes his next, uh, next uh, TV announcement, uh, we told in advance that it's going to happen. Uh, we told on News 24, on SABC, on SATV, social media is all about. That's what John the Baptist is doing here. He's preparing the way. If the king of the Zulus, if the queen of England were to visit us post-COVID on a Sunday morning, well, we would let you all know. We would make an announcement over and over again. We would tell you how to behave. We tell Kate not to put the king of the Zulus on the T roster. We tell uh, Black not to sing rap to the queen. Black, for goodness sake, she's 94 years old. She went to school with, with Bach and Beethoven. Well, that's what's happening here. Mark is preparing the way. Not Mark, John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus. A good question is, why does Mark take us back to the Old Testament prophets? Well, Mark wants us to understand that this Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophets. He's not, an, he's not a Johnny-come-lately. He's not an afterthought when all else fails. When Israel was in exile because of their rebellion against God, the Old Testament's the Old Testament prophets prophesied that God would send a savior. He would send a king. He would send a Messiah who would establish a people, an eternal people, an eternal kingdom. Remember Isaiah 9. This was written 700 years before the birth of Christ. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so what we have here in verse 4 to 8 is John the Baptist preparing the way for the Wonderful Counselor, for the Mighty God, for the Everlasting Father, for the Prince of Peace. When you meditate on those names, doesn't it make your mouth water? He's not just a king, he's the king. So how does John the Baptist prepare the way for the coming king? By showing people their sin, by showing people their need of a savior, by showing people that the Messiah was imminent, which brings us to the baptism of Jesus, our third point. First of all, his identity. Secondly, his roots. Thirdly, his family. And let's read from verse 9 to 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Now, if you look at this passage, verse 9 comes as a real, real surprise. We've just been preparing for the coming of the only Messiah, the only Savior, the only King, the only Son of God. There are trumpets, there's bugles, there's a French horn, lights, camera, action. Surprise, shock. The frame is filled with Nazareth. Whoever, whoever has heard of Nazareth? Where on earth is Galilee? I thought Jordan was a brand. And you want me to believe that this is the great king, the only king, the cosmic king. It beggars belief. But you see, that's, that's the extraordinary God of the Bible. He often works in the most unexpected ways. He can turn good out of evil. He can turn a crisis, a plague, to his advantage. He can rescue the cosmic world not from Rome or Washington or Beijing, but from, from Nazareth, a one-horse town in a third-rate province at the back end of the Roman Empire. Don't for one moment underestimate the purposes, the plans, the providence, the ingenuity of God's plan in your life right now. 2021. It's COVID-19. It's Gauteng, South Africa. This is not God's maiden flight. He's not an apprentice. He's not a rookie. He knows exactly what he's doing in your life right now. Perhaps it's time to trust him. The second surprise, also here in verse 9, is the Messiah, the Son of God, lines up with sinners confessing their sins, coming for baptism. What was he thinking? In Mark's Gospel, the word baptism isn't only used for water baptism. Jesus also uses the word as a symbol of the cross. And you can pick that up in chapter 10, verse 38. What Jesus is doing here is that though he was without sin, not needing a baptism of repentance, he's identifying with sinners. That's what he's doing. And that's exactly what he did on the cross, a baptism of fire, taking our sin upon himself, quenching the wrath of God on behalf of sinners like you and me. So in some ways here in verse 9, John Mark is giving us a first hint of the cross, the first stench of a dead body. So thus far, John Mark has answered two key questions. Question one, who is the man Jesus? The answer is verse one, he is the Christ, the Son of God. Question two, why did he come? Well, the answer, verse nine, to identify with sinners. A baptism of water, a baptism of fire, a baptism of wood. Then you'll notice verse 10 to 11, there are three critical events there. The heavens are torn open, the spirit de descends, and a voice is heard from heaven. Now from the prophet Malachi to up until John the Baptist, there was 400 years of silence, no prophet from God, no voice from heaven. And yet the Old Testament prophets prophesied that precisely these supernatural events that we read in verse 10 and 11 would occur with the coming of the Messiah. They would occur with the dawning of a new age, a new, a new eschatological age. These are the things that would, would occur when the great king arrives. Not a king, but the king. Now we need to be very careful here. Mark is not telling us about the work of the Holy Spirit in your life or my life. Don't expect voices from heaven. Don't expect a dove on your head. In fact, if you see a dove approaching, mind your head because we know what doves do. In fact, notice verse 10 uh, that a dove didn't descend on the head of Jesus, but the Spirit descended on him like a dove. 
So this is not what the Holy Spirit does in your life or my life. We'll come to that later in Mark. But what the Holy Spirit did in the life of Christ, the Messiah, the King. And let's not whitewash or Photoshop the miraculous nature of what's happening here. It is miraculous. It's supernatural. The, heaven is, the heavens are torn open. They're torn asunder. Uh, the Spirit descends like a dove. There's a voice from heaven. It's clearly supernatural, and that's not illogical. It's not unreasonable, if you think about it. We're talking about God. We're talking about God taking cosmic action to destroy our three great enemies, sin and death and Satan. We're talking about God ushering in a new age. You'd expect it to be supernatural, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be strange if it wasn't? In the creation account of Genesis 1, there are three persons active in creation. The creation of the world. You have God, you have God's spirit, and you have God's word. Check it out. Genesis 1, 1 to 3. It's quite extraordinary. In the first three verses of the Bible, we are introduced to the triune God. The same three parties are active here in verse 10 and 11. The Father is the voice, the Spirit is the dove, the Son is the word. And John Mark is intentionally pointing us back to creation, to the beginning. Just as the original creation was the work of the triune God, now the recreation, the renewal, is the work of the triune God. That's how cosmically central is the coming of Christ. It's as profound as the creation of the universe. When Jesus comes out of the water, the Father covers him with words of love. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Meanwhile, the Spirit covers him, the Son, with power. And the Son responds to the Father in obedience. This has been the interior life of the Trinity for all eternity. It's a glimpse of the heart of reality. It's the essence of the universe, God in three persons. So, as I said before, at the center of the universe is not a philosophy, is not an impersonal mathematical formula. No, at the center of the universe is a triune God, one God made up of three persons, perfectly communicating with each other, perfectly sharing with each other, perfectly loving each other. And we have a glimpse of that here in verse 9 to 11. C.S. Lewis, who is probably my favorite author, he said, I quote, In Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama, almost, if you will, not think me irreverent, a kind of dance, end of quote. Tim Keller puts it so well, I quote, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, each enjoying the other, each serving, adoring the other, each, uh, instead of being self-centered, self-focused, their mutual self-giving love. No person in the Trinity demands the others to revolve around him, but each of them voluntarily circles and orbits around the others. End of quote. That was what the Trinity was doing before creation. That was what the Trinity was doing at creation. That is what the triune God is doing at the beginning of the recreation, continuing this divine dance. A good question is, why would a triune God create the world? Why would a triune God create the world? If God was unipersonal, only one person, you could say he created the world because he was lonely. He needed someone to speak to. He needed someone to love. But that's obviously not true of the triune God. Their, their love for each other is much more pure and much more powerful than humans could ever give them. There's only one answer. He created the world not to get love, but to give love. Not to get joy, but to give joy. 
He created us to invite us into the dance. And you don't enter the dance by, by trying to be spiritual. You don't enter the dance by praying when you're in trouble. You don't enter the dance by wanting God to orbit around you, supplying your shopping list. No, you enter the dance when you respond to what God says. If you glorify me, if you center your entire life on me, if you find me beautiful for who I am, then you will enter the dance, which is precisely what you were made for, what you were created for, what you were built for. Obvious question is, have you entered the dance? Well, let me close by moving from dancing with the Trinity to dancing into battle. Very quickly and briefly, his enemy, verse 12. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Well, after the baptism, there's no, there's no celebration. There's no after party. There's no time to catch your breath. The shock here. Notice the shock, verse 12, is that it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who immediately drives him into the wilderness in order that he may be tempted by Satan. So at first you think it's a misprint, it's a typo. But it's not. 1 John 3, verse 8, the Apostle John says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So in effect, what the Spirit is saying to Jesus is Jesus, here's the reason you came. Here's the reason you were commissioned in your baptism. You came to be sent into warfare, into conflict. So let's get into it straight away, says the Spirit. John Mark, knowing Genesis 3, intentionally wants us to remember that the first Adam was tempted by Satan and failed. But here in Mark 1, the second Adam is also tempted by Satan, but he doesn't fail. Thank God. Here we have the beginning of the end of the curse of sin, of Satan. To be continued. Well, let's pray. Let's spend a few moments of quiet as we reflect on God's word. And you may want to speak to God, tell him where you are. Almighty Heavenly Father, we, we stand in awe again of the infinite, omnipotent, everlasting God of all creation. We stand in awe because we are finite and fallen and you are infinite and holy. Oh, Lord, will you forgive us for not trusting you as we ought? Forgive us for not remembering that you are trustworthy and you know exactly what you are doing. Forgive us, Lord, when we've tried to find answers and meaning and solace in the trivia and trinkets of this world and not in the Savior, the King, the Messiah, the Son of God. Oh Lord, will you deal with us? Will you forgive us? Will you cleanse us? But above all, will you cause us to drink deeply from the living water? 
which is Jesus. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, just before we come to the Lord's table, let me just encourage you that this year, I think we really want to be serious with God. There's no other way, is there? And I want to encourage you not only to read through Mark's gospel this, this, uh, this coming week, and next week, God willing, we'll look at verses 14 through to verse 28, so especially do have a look at that. But I want you to encourage to buy two books. You may be hard up, but if you only buy two Christian books this year, there's one book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's a brilliant book. It's not light reading. But if you're going to be serious with God, you need to understand God seriously. Knowing God by J.I. Packer, you can get it on Amazon, on Kindle. The second book is not about knowing God, but about feeling God. And it's a book by a man called Dane Ortland, O-R-T-L-A-N-D, called Gentle and Lowly. Magnificent. Why don't you? No, not, not why don't you? I want to urge you. Get those two books and read them and study them and have a pencil and paper and make notes so that we can be serious with God. The way to be serious with God is to study God, and to get to know him better. Well, let me stop there. Well, we come now from the Lord's word to the Lord's table. You are welcome at the Lord's table. You don't need to be a member of this church, but you do need to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't yet uh, collected uh, something, do quickly fetch uh, some grape juice or any juice or even water, uh, a piece of bread or a biscuit or a rusk. doesn't really matter. Uh, you, don't, uh, you may be a child, you may be a teenager. What is important is that you need to personally and sincerely trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we are doing with the Lord's table, there's nothing mystical or magical about the bread or the grape juice. No, we remember the body and the blood of Christ. We remember the substitutionary death of Christ, that he died in my place, that he took my sins upon himself to rescue me and to give me life and purpose. When I take part of the bread and the grape juice and I eat and drink, will you do that with me so that we can do that together? We may not be, uh, we may not be together in person, but we are together in spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he, had given it, when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we pray that you may cleanse us and wash us, not because we are religious or righteous or self-righteous, but because of what Christ has done for us. Cleanse us, Lord, and wash us. Give us a new heart and a new spirit that you may be central to our lives. 
We pray, Lord, that as we go into this new year, that every action, every thought, every word, every relationship, we may center upon serving Christ, living for Christ, dying for Christ. Father, feed us through your word and your spirit. Wash us again because of the blood of Christ. Fill us that you may use us to be your people, your ambassadors, your instruments, wherever you've placed us, and that we may serve Christ in all that we do. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Well, it's been a great, great joy to be with you this morning. Next week, if you can pick up from chapter 1, verse 14 to 28, God willing, we'll continue our study in the Gospel of John Mark. God bless you and have a good week.